I'm Jane Velez Mitchell, founder of Unchained TV, and you are participating in the very first Sunday Salon. I am here with Dr. Silas Rao, and he is a noted systems engineer who worked for some of the biggest high-tech companies in the world. And then he decided to devote his life to solving the climate crisis. Now, Dr. Rao says he has solved the climate crisis and has a solution to global warming. You know, the clock is ticking. So you'd think people would wanna hear it, right? No, apparently you can't get the powers of be to take you seriously and to even listen or acknowledge. They basically say you're wrong, but they won't tell you why you're wrong. Lay it out for us. I mean, tell us what exactly you think the solution is and what, what this, block is where people are not really even taking the time to consider that you might be right. Yeah, uh, I have, well, it's not that complicated to understand. You just have to go to it. And, you know, normally as systems engineers, we take a 10,000 foot perspective. Here you have to take a 10,000 year perspective. When you look at it from a 10,000 year perspective, you realize that we have cut half the trees on the planet, okay? And we have destroyed uh, so many of the ecosystems on the planet, or mainly for animal agriculture, just to get animal foods on our table, okay? 85% of the food we eat is already plant-based. Only 15% comes from animal sources. 12% comes from land animals, and 3% comes from the ocean. Okay? So totally, this is all data from the UN IPCC. This is not something that, you know, everyone knows this is what is going on. And to get that 12% of the food from animal sources, we are using 40% of the land area of the planet, at least, okay? Most of it in the form of grazing lands and then crop lands from which we are taking food and giving it to the animals. And then we're eating the animals. So for every one pound of animal food we eat, and this includes meat, dairy, and eggs put together, for every one pound, we are actually giving the animals 39 pounds of food to eat. Oh, well, that is wildly inefficient. And I know that there are 80 billion animals that we kill every year for food on this planet. And that sounds crazy. A lot of the times I'll say to people, how many animals do you think humans kill every year for food? And they'll say, well, oh, maybe a hundred million or something. Actually, it's 80 billion. And what people right. don't really think about is that those animals are eating a lot of food. Yeah. If you look at animals, they're called concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, giant warehouses where animals are kept now, the, the old farm of your imagination uh, pretty much is, is like a, a boutique thing that, that is scattered a couple of times throughout each state. But the vast majority of animals are in these concentrated animal feeding operations where they're kept confined to eat food, to fatten them up, to kill. For example, pigs are killed at approximately six months age. So, um, what happens if you move around? You burn calories. So they don't want them to burn calories. They keep them very confined and they just feed them all the time. Well, that food could be going to humans who are starving. So that's another issue entirely. But what you're saying is that animal agriculture is using a lot of the resources of this planet. Right. So my question to you is, how does that connect to climate change? One thing that I never really thought about that you had told me and I think this is generally acknowledged because I looked it up afterwards, is that trees absorb carbon. Right. So if you have a lot of trees, you're absorbing a lot of carbon. Carbon is what's heating the earth. So when you cut all the trees down for animal agriculture, you're removing the ability for the planet to absorb the carbon at the rate that it really needs to. Is that right? That's absolutely right. So basically what's happening is that we have cut half the trees on the planet. There used to be like five to six trillion trees. Now there are only three trillion trees on the planet, okay? And the, even the three trillion trees already are soaking up like nine trillion tons of CO2 in their bodies and in the soil. When you look at it all together, it's nine trillion tons of CO2 is in the vegetation and in the soil. Only three trillion tons is in the atmosphere. 
and we are complaining that the atmosphere has used to have 2 trillion tons of CO2, now it's 3 trillion tons of CO2. And that extra 1 trillion ton of CO2 is causing all this climate change. So you know there is 9 trillion tons already on uh, in, uh, in land, in CO2, in the form of vegetation and soil. And 40% of the land has hardly any CO2 because we cut it all up and we are using it to feed our animals because it's only growing grass. So if you look at the distribution of CO2, 98% of CO2 is in the land that doesn't have animal agriculture on it. When Only you say 2%. it has, 90% of CO2 is in the land. I don't really understand. 98%. It's in the land. What does that mean? Yes. It's in the, it's in the tree. See, if you look at a tree, tree is basically the output of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is sucking down the CO2, turning it into oxygen, and then hydrocarbons for the tree to grow. Right? So oxygen this goes out from the car CO2 and the carbon stays in the tree. That's what photosynthesis does. Mm. Right? Okay. So if you look at the weight of a tree, okay, and when you when I talk about weight, I'm always talking about dry weight. Mm -hmm. Because trees have water in them, mm -hmm. you know, vegetables have water in them, mm -hmm. you know, everything has water in them. So you have to first take out the water and then weigh it. Mm -hmm. Right? If you look at the dry weight of a tree, okay. And you look at both the uh, above ground weight and the below ground weight because half the weight of the tree is below ground. That's in the roots. Mm. Okay. So then you measure the weight of the tree and you quadruple it. Okay. That will give you the total amount of actually uh, the above ground weight. If you quadruple it, it will give you the total amount of CO2 that that tree is storing. Okay. See, now I've just learned something because you, you had mentioned in the past, which I looked up, that trees absorb carbon, but I didn't really absorb the fact that they that they store it. In other they words, it. they store it so that when you get rid of the trees, they can't store that carbon. So that carbon is in the atmosphere and continues to heat up the earth. Yeah, when you cut a tree... Yeah. Either you burn the tree, in which case the carbon becomes CO2 right away when you burn it, mm -hmm. or it decays, and as it decays, this carbon becomes CO2 again. So it goes up into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. right? So uh, when you grow a tree, you're actually actively taking CO2 from the atmosphere and putting it in the ground. Mm. It's in the form of the tree. So this seems pretty simple. What you're saying, if I had to boil it down, is okay, we've destroyed a lot of trees for cattle grazing and to grow crops to feed factory farmed animals. 80 billion. Now you can look that up. That's not in dispute. There's yeah. 80 billion animals that we kill every year for food. Land animals, we're not talking fish. If we include fish, it's in the trillions. Yeah. So um, what you're saying is that we could solve the climate crisis by ending animal agriculture, reforesting the cattle grazing land, mm -hmm. And uh, that reforested land would start absorbing and storing that carbon, and we could bring the Earth's temperature back down. Exactly. And how quickly could this happen? It happens that you know, every year it starts sucking down. So when you start seeing the CO2 level in the atmosphere come down, then you can go and see what's going on with the other loops and you know the feedback loops that have been triggered. Mm -hmm. Right. So it will start coming down right away. It's not, you don't have to wait 20 years for it to come down. It'll start coming down right away. And then the trees will grow. As they grow, they're, they're storing more and more CO2. So in the limit, it will, we will reverse climate change, right? If we bring back the original forest that used to be there on that land, you can reverse climate change. Meaning you can bring the temperature back to what it was in 1800. Wow. Well, let me ask you this question. It takes a while for trees to grow, right. although in tropical climes, they grow very, very rapidly. Right. I mean, we've got a lot here near where I live that was supposed to be developed and it wasn't developed. And now it's like a forest right. because nobody's touching it. And there's weeds and there's all sorts of little trees that are growing. And I, I actually noted how quickly it grows. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is end the cattle grazing, reforest that land, um, and just allow those trees to grow quickly, we'd have to do a major planting of trees, obviously. There'd have to be some kind of major planting, right? Well, in a lot of places, the seeds are already there in the ground. You know, what we are doing when we graze animals, 
is that every year, whatever the animals did not eat, we are chopping and burning. This is, these are called pasture maintenance fires. Mm -hmm. Because if, if we don't chop and burn, the forest will come back. Mm -hmm. So the animal agriculture industry says, we don't want the forest to come back. We're going to have to chop it down and burn it because we want it to remain as grazing land. So that is also not, not even being counted when people do uh, greenhouse gas emissions are counted. Mm -hmm. there are lots of things that are not being counted. That's all caused by the animal agriculture industry. So let's talk a little bit. I mean, to me, this makes sense. This is not something that's going way over my head. I'm not a climate scientist or engineer, but I can get this basic concept. It's a very simple concept. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think people are not listening um, or actually really, I think you've told me some stories that, that scientists are, are, or scientific community or the government or certain media outlets are very angry that you're discussing this. Now, before I get to that, I want to point out something uh, that I want the audience to see. Uh, you may be able to read this. The meat industry blocked the IPCC's attempt to recommend a plant-based diet. This is an article that frankly should have been on the front page of the New York Times, but it was in Quartz and also Distilled. And it says the meat industry blocked the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of uh, the attempt by that organization. Let me read it again. The meat industry blocked the IPCC's, which is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's a UN agency. The meat industry blocked the IPCC's attempt to recommend an, a plant-based diet. A leaked draft revealed how the meat industry is obstructing efforts to curb climate change. So a bunch of scientists worked a long time on a report about combating climate change and said that people should transition to a plant-based diet. Probably because of the same thing that you're right. saying, right. That, right. that this is a way for all of us not to feel powerless that we have to wait for governments. It's a way for all of us three times a day to take action to reverse climate change. And indeed, at COP27 and COP26, I believe, mm -hmm. they did not serve very many vegan meals, but they did issue a climate price tag on each meal. And even the Washington Post wrote up an article and said, wait a second, since your meat items have such a higher climate price tag than your vegan items, why are you even serving your meat items? So I don't think there's any dispute that we've all acknowledged, and this these articles as well acknowledge that beef is the most, uh, it has the highest climate price tag of any food. And right up there with beef is pork, mutton, cheese. They're at the very top. So nobody's disputing that. So what you're also saying is people can take action on their own by choosing a plant-based diet to do their part to reduce climate change. This is very simple stuff. This is not, you know, I don't know about uh, the intricacies of methane or the intricacies of carbon. Basically, plants have a lower carbon footprint than beef. And so the scientists recommended this and the report cut it out. This is not me saying it, it's in quartz. It's also in another newspaper article called Distilled and there's a few others but it's not in any really big papers like the New York Times or the Washington Post. Okay, that's what the powers that be read or, or the New York Times and the Washington Post. So why do you feel you're getting such resistance when this is, I mean, the clock's ticking, we're barreling toward a climate apocalypse, we're seeing the tornadoes, the fires, the extreme rains, the floods, um, the drought, the deforestation, the extinction of wildlife at an extraordinary rate. We're seeing all this. And it's not just me saying this. Sir David Attenborough has done a great documentary. I think it's called Breaking Boundaries. It's on a major streaming network. I believe it's Netflix. And he talks about once you break those boundaries, there's a, you know, I don't know, maybe eight or nine of them. There's no coming back from them. Like once the glaciers um, melt, 
You can't just say, hey, let's let's buy some new glaciers. It's gone. So we're running out of time. There is a solution. It makes very common sense. It's a commonsensical solution. Why are you getting such pushback uh, from, let's just call them the powers that be? Because they are the powers that be. They don't want to give up their power. It's that simple, you know, because it's a systemic issue. It's a system that depends on exploiting animals. If you cannot exploit animals, you cannot exploit people. It's a system that's exploiting people, it's exploiting animals, it's exploiting everybody, right? And so those who are high up in the, in the system are saying, I don't want to give up my power because I want to continue exploiting people. I also want to continue exploiting animals. And if I, if I say we don't have to exploit animals anymore, then how can I go around exploiting people? <laughs> you know? Well, I, I, I'll bring it back down to a, maybe a more, <laughs> well, yeah, follow the money. I always say with all exploitation, follow the money. The meat and dairy, and I put in big pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, they're very powerful. In fact, I was just reading an article today uh, in the New York Times about how this very infamous family that ran a notorious uh, prescription drug company was giving money to all sorts of big, big, very prestigious institutions that were making recommendations about what else? About addiction, about pain management. They were taking money from the very people who've created the problem. Millions. Okay, this was in the New York Times. So it's not like this is that far-fetched. This kind of, um, it's corruption. I mean, it may not even be legal corruption, but it's obviously moral corruption. Uh, it happens. And, and then you know that our government is co-opted essentially by the meat, dairy, and big pharma industry. I mean, the, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, is run by a dairy industry trade group leader. Right. Okay, so the dairy industry runs the United States Department of Agriculture. Right. And he was also in the Obama administration. He's back for a second time, right. uh, Tom Vilsack. So, you know, you've got the meat industry blocking the UN uh scientists that wanted to recommend a plant-based diet because that's something that we could all do. We're not all able to go out and buy a fancy Tesla. Okay. But we can all eat fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains and make those choices in our grocery store. So again, I'm not exactly sure why that in particular, because they do let people rail against fossil fuels. Although apparently some, some um, discussion of fossil fuels was also censored. But, but it seems like the meat and dairy part really, really upsets the apple cart more, unintended. Right. Absolutely. Why is that? Because meat and dairy is the roots of colonialism. It's the roots of sexism. It's the root of all of the isms that we are talking about, that we have been trying to eradicate for centuries. Why haven't we done it yet? Because we are still eating meat and dairy. That is the foundation. If you... Get rid of that. You can get rid of gender discrimination. You can get rid of, you know, I mean, you can really create a new system that is about justice. I don't get the connection, though. Okay. I don't get the connection. but I get the connection between colonialism. Hmm. And here's how it was funny because I was reading, a, I was listening to a course, a great courses, a big history course. And it talked about, you know, colonialism existed and then it was overthrown on a government level but the colonialism continued on a commerce level yeah so in other words technically certain nations were independent but in truth they were they were still being controlled by the economic forces of exactly. western europe exactly yes exactly yes through the currency mechanism yes they are still yes controlling it. yes and this is why you see there are 30 million acres of forest being cut down every year. There are people living in that forest. There are animals living in that forest. And it's been chopped down. Did we go ask the people permission to chop it down? No, we forced them out. And how did we force them out? The corporations went in and did that. Okay, it's usually the meat and dairy corporations that are doing that. They are the tip of colonialism. That's the sphere of colonialism. Because the indigenous people have no say. We told them, you know, your culture is not as important as our culture. So we are going to have to take away your land and turn that into grazing land for animals so that we can eat more meat and dairy here. 
Okay, that is colonialism one on one. That's really what's going on in the Amazon, mm. right? Well, they have acknowledged. I will say that major media has acknowledged that the primary reason that the Amazon is being deforested is for cattle grazing. You do see that all the time. Now, when they say logging, it's kind of funny because logging is a, a byproduct. Right. In other words, oh, you're going to cut down uh, the Amazon to create cattle grazing land. Well, well, after you cut down the trees, let's sell them too. Right. Sometimes they'll say, well, for logging, but it's really for animal agriculture and right. logging is just a byproduct. Right. Right. Yeah, so um, this is fascinating. Well, let me ask you this question. We're running out of time. Um, we, the clock is ticking. In fact, uh, full disclosure, and I would love you to watch it on Unchained TV, uh, which is our global streaming network to promote a healthy plant-based life, lifestyle for climate, for, for the animals, for human health. And by the way, these animals are my, uh, my babies. This is Sunday and that's my newest adopter. Adoptee is Wednesday. And, um, uh, Yes, you want to show Wednesday? Give give them a, a little <laughs> shot. Wednesday, there we are. And this is Sunday, and they're both rescues. Please adopt, don't shop, of course. But um, you know, uh, the clock is ticking. I mean, everybody's talking about climate crisis. They're marching in the streets, but even environmentalists resist uh, adopting a plant based diet. It's, yeah. In fact, you were telling me that some of the biggest environmental groups are all bent out of shape because you're saying, well, if you, and, and it's not just you, a lot of people are saying now, if you really want to be an environmentalist, you should be plant-based. Right. Absolutely. There's no question in my mind. See, if you're an environmentalist, you're either vegan or you haven't understood the data. It's as simple as that. Okay. Wow. And yeah, there's no question in my mind. You have to be completely vegan if you're an environmentalist. Now, let me ask you a question. You've written a white paper mm -hmm. and, um, you know, some people go, well, look, the, the UN says 14 and a half percent, right? Uh, that's that for that animal agriculture is responsible for 14 and a half percent. But prior to that, um, there was a report. I think it was what, 2006, 2008? 2000. Livestock's Long Shadow? That was 2006. Okay, in 2006, there's a report. You can Google it. It's called Livestock's Long Shadow. And the bottom line of the re very lengthy report, which was put out by the United Nations, said livestock is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than all transportation. Okay, so eating meat causes more greenhouse gas than all transportation. That is what the UN said. That's not what I said, okay? Um, then uh, a couple of scientists who were working for a very big organization said it was 51%. No, it's 51%. Then they got pushed back. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden it went down to 14.5%. Now you're saying it is overwhelmingly the leading cause. And you're saying 87% of... Greenhouse gas emissions are ultimately caused by uh, animal agriculture. Now, let me just say something before we dive in. It's a very big subject, okay? This is a very, very big subject. So it depends on how you calculate it, obviously. With a subject this big, it depends on how many years you're looking at um, and, and all sorts of other factors. So, uh, yeah, tell us about your your white paper, and it was peer-reviewed and published where? Tell us about that. The Journal of Ecological Society. It okay. was published in the Journal of Ecological Society in 2021. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are several scientists who have gone through it, who have gone through all my calculations, checked it against what I'm referring to. And they have also, you know, they did find one uh, mistake, and that was just a, you know, 10% difference that I had to change. Yeah. So but you've changed updated. that. Yeah, of course. It's all updated yeah. now. Yes. yes. Yeah. So um, nonetheless, there are some people who get very angry and say, no, it's wrong. And you say, point out where it's wrong, right? And they've yet to do so. Yeah. See, the trouble is the UN, just like they did that with the, with the plant-based diet, the meat industry has been coming in there and saying, you can't count that. You can't count that. You can't count that. And lots of things we are not counting from the meat and dairy industry. Okay. All Can you give me an example? Like livestock breeding. 
So they're not counting the breathing, the CO2 that comes out of the nose of, of animals, because you're, even though they're raising like 80 billion of these animals every year and killing them, and that is way beyond the amount of number of animals that used to be there on this planet before we did all this. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, if you look at the total weight of animals, the, the, our livestock is the equivalent of 10 times the weight, the weight of animals that used to live 10,000 years ago. And are you telling me that that's still part of nature? You know, even though it's 10 times, we caused it. Right. So we caused it. So yeah. we are saying the methane that comes out of a cow, we are going to count as human made, human caused. But the CO2 that comes out of an animal, we don't count because that's nature. Are you out of your mind? I mean, you don't count one thing and not the other. How did the cow become nature, uh, part of nature when it comes to CO2, but not part of nature when you're doing methane? Mm. This this sort of you know dishonest accounting is all over the IPCC's reports. Mm -hmm. I have counted mm. six different ways in which the IPCC is deliberately downplaying the impact of animal agriculture and trying to pretend it's all because of fossil fuels. Okay. Now why I'm are I'm not saying it's not because of, I'm saying fossil fuels are part of it too. Sure. But the number one thing you need to do if you want to address climate change is to go vegan. Period. And I, dis and I, you know, I dare anyone to dispute me on that. Okay. Now, Show me, me why I'm wrong. Yeah. I say that. That's the thing. It's like, if you have a problem with Dr. Rao, come forward with details, not just it's wrong. Yeah. So Precisely. I'm not a scientist, so I'm not uh, equipped to make the calculations, but you're saying that you would, you would debate any of these people. Absolutely. I mean, look, there is so much, uh, I see a tremendous lack of either academic integrity or lack of courage in the system. You know, people are afraid to say these things. People are afraid to come out and say, you know, this is what is really going on. We need to address this. Mm. You know, the UN actually identified three problems, not just one. So it was biodiversity loss, which is the Loss of wild animals. We know how fast they're dying off. And how fast are they dying off? Oh, it's horrible to think yeah. about the data. Because between 1970 and 2010, 52% of all wild vertebrates died off. Wow. And then that became 58% by 2012, 68% by 2016. Now they're saying it's 70% by 2018. Okay. So it's... By 2018. Eight, eight, so Oh, it, oh! It, in other words, it was it was exactly seventy percent of wildlife has died off already between nineteen seventy and two thousand eighteen. You know, from ten thousand years ago to nineteen seventy, we wiped out another sixty percent of them. So we wiped out sixty percent of them between ten thousand years ago and nineteen seventy, and then from nineteen seventy to two thousand eighteen, another seventy percent of the remaining forty percent. Yeah. So, you know, by when will we have no wild animals? Well, I mean, it's going to hit a point of no return, meaning you cannot bring back the wild animals if you keep killing them all off. Because there won't be any members of the species left. That's what's called ecosystem collapse. That was the second major environmental problem that the UN identified. So there is biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. And then the third was climate change. Now you ask me, what is the number one thing you can do to address biodiversity loss? go vegan of course because again it's the animals losing their habitat for cattle grazing land or for crop land to grow crops to feed 80 billion animals okay we're eight billion humans mm -hmm. so are we eating more or less than the farmed animals oh we are eating way less than the farmed animals see the farmed animals are eating according to the un the farmed animals are eating 7.3 billion tons of food every year and this is the weight of food when you measure the dry weight. Mm -hmm. Take out the water and measure Yes, it. yes. 7.3 billion tons. We eat 1.6 billion tons of food. All of us put together. Yes. Okay, every year. Right. Sometimes I feel like I've eaten a billion tons of food. <laughs> no, but uh, okay. So what you're saying is animals, farmed animals, cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, goats, lambs are eating five times as much food as we eat. Meanwhile, people are dying of starvation. Exactly. Starvation is a choice we are making. World hunger is a choice we are making when we eat animals. Okay. 
And this is why when, when we stop eating animals, there won't be any world hunger. If there is no world hunger, then how are you going to get people to do things they don't want to do? <laughs> that is their problem. This is why they don't want it to happen hmm. because they are stuck. So yes. you're saying if we lived in a world of natural abundance where everybody had enough to eat because it would be distributed to everyone uh, instead of just being given to farm, most of it given to farmed animals. Like I understand 70% or more of soy is fed directly to farming animals. Right. And because sometimes they say, well, the food that farmed animals eat, the humans couldn't eat. <laughs> yeah, what about the soy, right? Yeah, the <laughs> soy. Okay, for example, yeah, I'm going to have edamame for lunch. So... <laughs> Um, yeah. you're saying we could feed that directly to people. Everybody would have more than enough food. There'd be no starvation. And so you can't make money off of, you know, there's scarcity creates, um, a, a rise in price. Exactly. That's the system so, we have. Yes. Yeah. So if, if there's food scarcity, you have a rise in price. We're seeing that right now with inflation. Ironically, the inflation is also affecting the farmers. So some of them are sending their animals to slaughter because the price of hay has gone up so much. Mm -hmm. So scarcity creates demand. And you're saying if, if you got rid of animal agriculture, food would be so cheap and it'd be so plentiful that everybody get it almost for nothing. And so what's the problem with that? The problem is that you cannot make people go do mining work or slaughterhouse work. I mean, the kinds of work that no one really wants to do but we're forcing people to do it because otherwise they would starve to death. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the, we have a system of normalized violence. Yes. That's what we have, right? Yes, yes. And there's violence towards the animals, there's violence towards people, depend, you know, there's violence towards uh, those who are below us, so to speak. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. So you, how do you maintain a system of normalized violence when everyone is well-fed? You can't. Mm. Because people are going to say, hey, I'm well-fed. I, I don't have to do that anymore. So I'm going to go away. Well, what about housing? Well, see there again, you know, it's again scarcity. We create scarcity. We're saying somebody has this huge house and a huge amount of land. And then you don't have any land because you don't have the money and you have to go get the money. So it's a game of scarcity. The money game is a game of scarcity. And that is the root of all our problems. If you look at a systems issue, mm -hmm. systems, how do you solve the systems mm -hmm. problem? You have to change the game of money. Okay. The game of money is a, it's deliberately. These are all games we are playing. Mm -hmm. Basically, we have rules in the game. Yes. You can create money. You and I cannot create money, right? Even though it's a piece of paper with pictures of George Washington on. Yeah. I mean, I can print it on my own printer. Yeah. You know? No, but I can't do that. Only a bank can create money. Yeah. Right. If you create money, they throw you in jail. That's right. Illegal. Right. It's the, illegal. Yeah. It's illegal in the game. It's a game. Yeah. Illegal in the game. Well, right? but I mean, uh, okay, I, this is going to a new direction. And I think that's interesting, but yeah. uh, you know, we talked about solving climate crisis. You're, you're saying that basically uh, the powers that be, the big systems, the big money are very threatened by the idea that people could take the power back by going yes. plant-based, exactly. by going vegan. Exactly. If they took the power back and all of a sudden, uh, well, certainly the meat, dairy, pharmaceutical industry would would have to either change radically or collapse. The fast food industry, mm -hmm. um, what other industries? I mean, uh, but but well, how do you see this all playing out? Because the reason is we don't have a hundred years to figure this out. Yeah, We've yeah. only got what a decade or less or less. Yeah. In yeah. fact, I say we don't even know whether we have crossed over. Tipping to the point, not. yeah, we the don't point. know if we, we don't know that. So, which means that. the sooner the better. The yeah. sooner we figure out what is this new game we need to be playing, and how do we transition from the old game to the new game? You know, I say that this is the most creative period in human history ever, mm -hmm. because we have to change our game. I say this: this is a compassionate revolution. So, revolution to create a compassionate world. And to me, that revolution is bigger and greater than the agriculture revolution, than the discovery of fire, than the scientific revolution, than the industrial revolution, than any other revolution that ever happened in human history. This is the greatest transformation in human history that we have been called to do. Who is calling us to do it? Mother Earth is. Mm -hmm. She's telling us, look, I'm giving you signals saying you are done. 
with the old model where you could exploit animals, exploit people and all that. That's over. Period. There is consequences for exploitation. And this is the greatest consequence she's telling us. Do it or I'm going to kill you. Yeah. No, okay. but, Fix it yeah. or I'm going to kill you. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I, I, I see this as a marathon that we've been running for at least 10,000 years. Yes. Since the start of agriculture. Yes. Okay. We've been running this marathon. Our ancestors have been working on it. And we have been heating the earth for 10,000 years. And so it's like you're running a marathon. It's been a straight line. Heat, 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 heat. Going this way. And now the signals from nature are saying you have to make a U-turn at the end to reach the final end point mm -hmm. of the marathon. So you've run 26 miles and you've got 0.2 miles to go. But there is a bend in the road. Okay. You have to turn around. If you insist on going straight, you're going to go over a cliff. Yeah. Right? I, I see that. I see that. Um, so to, to make that bend, you have to think of new games. You have to think of new ways of organizing ourselves. Think of a new purpose for humanity. See, right now, our purpose, what is our purpose in the game of money? It's just to make as much money as for yourself as possible. Yes. Okay. It's an accumulation game. Yes. Okay. How much can I grab? Or yes. Illegally. Right? Yes. If you grab illegally, they throw you in jail. Yes. Yes. Okay? So they make up these rules. Yeah. So these are the rules. And these rules are not something that, you know, somebody made up today. It's been going on for years, for yes. decades, right? So for just, centuries. For centuries. We, we, we inherited the game. Yes. Okay. So there's no one to blame in that sense. You're not yeah. playing It's a system. Here. You're it's saying a system. it's a system. It's a system. And I do wonder sometimes when people accumulate incredible wealth that obviously they can't take it with them. And then... I guess, you know, they're going to leave it to their family members or whatever, or, or they've created, they've done a lot of ecological damage, creating all this wealth, and then they're going to give a percentage of it to charity to undo some of the things that they've done. I, I don't want to go down that road too much. Um, you know, I mean, I just want to ask you a provocative question because, mm -hmm. you know, I was kind of raised like hard work is, is really important. Right. Um, discipline is important. Uh, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, don't take handouts. Um, do it yourself. You know, that's kind of how I was raised. And I believe in those values. And there's a big argument, you know, if you suddenly make everything abundant and free, that you're going to destroy the work ethic. Well, see, it's, it's health. When you're healthy, you automatically want to work. Mm. You automatically want to serve. That's health. Okay. When you, it's only when you're sick, you want to sit in some, just sit somewhere and just vegetate. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. No one really wants to vegetate if you're healthy. Mm. Interesting. That's see to me, it's a sign of sickness when you are uh, vegetating, right? Mm -hmm. So I get people healthy with healthy food healthy routines, you know, and there's the whole entire lifestyle medicine revolution that's happening today. Yes. It's all about making sure that people are healthy because when we are healthy, mm -hmm. each of us is healthy, we look to see how do we fix the problems around us. Mm. This is the oxygen mask rule, right? First, you have to get yourself healthy before you can heal the planet. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that if you want to heal the climate, first heal yourself. Mm. When you heal yourself, then you will see, oh, wow, you know, I can fix that. I can fix that. Here is my gift. Yeah. So I say that we are all here at this time because nature never makes mistakes like this. You know, mm. so it's like, are you telling me that if someone's sitting from outer space looking at what's happening on Earth for the last 10,000 years, will see this beautiful blue and green mm -hmm. ball going, going around and around and around, and suddenly there's a brown midriff mm -hmm. because we chopped down all the trees. Mm -hmm. Okay. As the brown midriff happened, mm -hmm. suddenly on the dark side of Earth, you see lights popping up. Mm. It's a magical, isn't it? Mm. So, well, there's midriff on this side, I mean, when, you, when it's light, but then you see all these lights popping up. Mm. You know? What is it all for? Well, we are creating homeostasis for planet Earth. That's what climate, heating, climate healing is all about. We heated the climate so that the earth can never go back to the ice age again. Mm -hmm. Okay, And now we have been called to turn it around and make heal it and then play an infinite game where you sustain it and maintain it forever. What is sustainability? Sustainability means that you can keep the same thing going forever. Mm -hmm. And to 
to create a sustainable civilization, you have to be playing infinite games. A game in which you, the purpose of the game is to continue the game forever. The current money game is about grab as much as you can because it's a finite game. It's a scarcity game. Because when you finish eating up the entire earth, there's nothing more to do. Yeah. You're all dead. Right. Except maybe one person will say, I'm the winner and he'll go off to Mars or something <laughs> like that, right? That's, yeah. And they're all figuring out how to get to Mars now, right? And I'm saying, what are you doing? Yeah. It's a beautiful planet here. Yeah. Take care of it. Yeah. Let's take care yeah. of it, right? Mm-hmm. And to take care of it, you have to create an infinite game from the finite game. And that is the U-turn we need to be making. Okay, right now, you're still playing finite games everywhere. You look at any sports we play. It's just one winner and all the rest are losers. Yes. Which means there's one guy who's really happy, maybe, for a moment. And then <laughs> everybody else is really sad and they're figuring out how to win next time. <laughs> These yeah. are all finite games. Yeah. The purpose of a finite game is to win the game. The purpose of an infinite game is to continue the game. Okay, so I just have a couple of wrap-up questions. Mm. Uh, this has been such a fascinating conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. But my question is, like, how is this going to play out? Like, uh, we've got, okay, less than a decade before some of these boundaries, there's no turning back. And it, it could be literally a couple of years in some of these cases. And so we have to make this transition quickly. Right. The powers that be are not listening. They're, uh, well, you're saying, yes, there's there's some movement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, honestly, I do believe one of the reasons why um, media is starting to really attack plant-based uh, meat alternatives is because it's threatening to them. Right. Uh, in fact, I was very happy to note that Unchained TV, <laughs> our, our global streaming network, was uh, described as a threat in an animal agriculture publication. Right. Um, but um, how are we going to make that shift? In other words, you, we need a sharp U-turn, but it doesn't seem like it's happening. Yes, there's a rise, a spectacular rise in, for example, plant-based milks mm-hmm. um, and meat alternatives, Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, uh, this is Gold Farb's Unreal Deli. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, Tofurky, I don't want to leave anybody out. Tons of products. Right. Um, but still, globally, meat consumption is increasing because the right. population is increasing. So how, how are we going to do it? I mean, what's going to happen? See, again, it starts with the purpose. What is yes. our purpose? Right yes. Now, right? So look at everyone's purpose now is to grab as much as you can. Right? Yes. That's what the purpose is. The purpose, in, when we make the U-turn, the purpose will be to restore the ecosystems of the planet. That will be our purpose as humanity, to restore the ecosystems of the planet. And so now you see who is putting money down to restore the ecosystems of the planet. They are the ones who are creating the new system. Okay, so like now the Indian government wants to do it. Wow. And I'm going there and trying to help them out. You know, and wow. say, well, How do we do this? Can you explain all this to them? Because personally, here's here's what I think. Whoever, whichever nation wakes up and realizes, wow, it doesn't matter how much money, you know, XYZ corporations or individuals have, if the planet is unlivable, the money doesn't count. Um, I just was really struck by an article I read about um, delivery men collapsing from the heat in the summertime because it's gotten so hot. Right. Um, we saw in Kansas, somebody took a videotape of uh, more than a thousand cows dead with their legs up in the air at the side of the road. They died because it was too hot. You know, it's going to become unlivable, okay? It is unlivable now with the growing extremes. Right. Um, so as those extremes increase, aren't these folks going to realize, you know what, it doesn't matter how much money I have. If I can't walk outside without fainting, I better, is that how the game's going to change? That's where... what's happening in India. You know, it's getting yeah. that hot. Right? Yes. So people are saying, hey, wait a minute, we can't live like this. Yes. Let's figure out how to restore the ecosystems, bring back the forest so that we can cool ourselves. So, so the Indian government, which I, I read that in, India could overtake China as the world's most populous nation soon. Mm-hmm. So India could take the lead on this if you convince them. And then they could literally become, I would say, the global leader for the next century because they would provide the template. Um, because frankly, with India's cultural and religious history, mm-hmm. uh, cows, for example, are 
hypothetically sacred, although watch two documentaries on Unchained TV, Land of Ahimsa and Makadu. Is that how you pronounce it? Makadu. They'll show you that cows are being badly exploited in India, even though they're supposedly sacred. But there is that basis, okay, with Buddha, with Gandhi, who said the moral stature of a nation can be judged by how it treats its animals. There is that history of more of a consciousness toward animals. So if you can make that, convince them that it's in their self-interest, okay, it, they actually could overtake um, the Western nations and become the leader for the future. It's a spiritual and cultural transformation. That's what's called for today. And uh, to me, India is the spiritual heart of Mother Earth. Okay. So India has to, will be taking the lead in this. There's no question in my mind. Okay. This uh-huh. is why I'm going back to India. And, uh, you know, and I'm saying, let us get it done. Let it, we know our ancestors are looking at us saying, when are you going to start? Come on, do it. Let's do it. Let's make this happen. Well, as they say, from your mouth to God's ear, <laughs> I hope it happens. I would love to see here in the United States, but I think that India is probably a, a, better, a better launch point, and I hope it spreads to the United States. You know, oh, just will. also listening to history is that nations that are on top don't stay there forever yeah see. and and the other thing that i've learned is that animals species that adapt survive right. if we don't learn to adapt as a species we say oh it's tradition i've got to eat this way because it's first of all it's not even tradition it's only a tradition for the last well when did the first mcdonald's open okay right. it's the 70s 60s okay 50s max it's not a tra- it's not really a tradition. Traditionally, if you want to look back in ancient times, the Romans ate mostly grapes, olives, and wheat. That's what that th- those were their three primary, and they had the Roman gladiators. <laughs> so, okay, we've we've said quite a bit. It's a lot to process. I hope that a you visit climatehealers.org and learn more about this. You can read the white paper. If you don't agree with it, you can debate Dr. Rao. He's issued an open invitation. He literally will debate anybody publicly who uh, says his white paper is wrong. And so uh, I would just urge you to have an open mind, open mind. The first sign that you're no longer brainwashed is when you ask yourself, am I being brainwashed? Am I being programmed? So just think for yourself for a second and think that all the different institutions that give you information have vested interests. If you look at advertiser-based TV, who are the advertisers? Meat, dairy, big pharma, mostly, with an insurance commercial thrown in for good measure every so often. So, of course, I was in the mainstream media for 38 years. You don't have to have somebody knock on your door. Don't talk about X, Y, Z. It's patently obvious. You just look at the advertisers. They pay the bills. They keep the lights on. So that's media. Government has been co-opted, as we mentioned, the USDA, et cetera. Um, The lobbyists, you know, I think Big Pharma has more lobbyists than anybody. If we're all healthy, we're not going to have to buy the cholesterol lowering pills, the statins, the all of the other pills. You know, a lot of a lot of it is based on poor lifestyle choices. So you've got media, you've got government, corporations, obviously. Well, it's obvious the corporations want to make money because this is a system where I see it all the time when I watch CNBC and I read the CNBC articles, growth. If you don't have growth, if the growth isn't as high as expected, your stock drops. So yeah, it's an unsustainable model. We can't all keep growing. We've got a finite planet. So think about all this. Remember, you have power to reverse climate change. You may think you're helpless. You may think you have to wait for government, media, and um, corporations to do the heavy lifting. No, you could start doing the heavy lifting every day, but it's not even heavy lifting. It's a joyous alternative. You'll be healthier. Eat fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, and legumes. And don't believe that it's more expensive, okay? It's actually cheaper. I, I would go on vacations with friends of mine who were meat eaters. We'd all go to the grocery store because we were sharing a place. And I'd come out with my vegetables and 
they have their stakes and their, their, their bill was much more than mine. Right. So don't buy all that stuff. Think for yourself. Use some logic and um, keep an open mind. See you next time here on Sunday Salon and um, download Unchained TV, the global streaming network.